if I just change how I'm thinking and approaching the world, if I do that, I am radically changing myself. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 454. Today, my guest is Sifu Steven Macromala. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, the founder of Whistlekick, host for Martial Arts Radio. Just a guy who really loves training. And that kind of grew, and well, look at where we are now. We're doing the show twice a week. We've got a ton of stuff going on, and it's all in support of the traditional martial arts. In fact, that's the goal for this show, to educate, inspire, connect traditional martial artists all across the globe. And we do that in a number of ways. The show, twice a week, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find out everything we've got going on with the show, transcripts, videos, photos, links. Listen to any episode we've ever done. Whistlekick.com. That's our digital hub, our online repository for every single project and product we're involved in. And if you check out those products, Use the code PODCAST15, get yourself 15% off, and help support the show and all of our endeavors at Whistlekick. Today's guest has a pretty cool story. He's done some pretty interesting things, and I'm not even going to pretend that I'm going to do its service to summarize it here before we get into the show. So instead of falling down on my face in some half-hearted attempt to do it, I'm just going to let him do it. Sifu Makramala, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Hey, the honor is mine. Thanks for coming on. We're we're talking. I mean, it's 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 on the early side of my day, but it's on the very early side of your day. If I it's if I'm doing time zone math correctly, balmy six a.m. here in Santa Cruz, California. <laughs> Um, well, I'm sure it's far balmier there than it is here. <laughs> I, I don't actually know where you are. Where are you exactly? Oh, I'm 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 in I'm in Vermont. You're in I'm Vermont. In Vermont and, ah, and, so you have lovely you snow, know, I, I believe, on the ground. Yes, already. Not not yet. It's knock on wood. It's supposed to happen this week. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we've been seeing some some pretty hard frosts and right, right. You know, yeah. waking up to twenty five, thirty degrees. Smell of snow early in the morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, um, I want to say um, that I really appreciate what work you guys do. Um, you know, you do an excellent job of, uh, you know, having a conversation about martial arts that opens up martial arts, all, opens up all the facets. It doesn't make it just about, you know, the, the conversation when you talk about martial arts to other people who don't know anything about it is, that, you know, they think it's about, you know, fighting, brutality, you know, just straight up violence or um, you know, it's the territory where, you know, trolls go to visit and they just like, you know, tear everything down. Oh, this is not practical <laughs> with a, you know, just like, you know, relish. <laughs> and you take the conversation away from, from that and you open it up to all the, the facets of what martial arts have to offer. And it's a much needed conversation. Um, it, it, it's great for everybody and, um, and it helps, it helps. It helps a tremendous deal. So thank you for, for the work that you do. Um, so I wanted to say that, that. Appreciate right it. off the bat. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. And, and I think that that just comes from my personal, I guess, love of the martial arts and, and the realization that martial arts can be and is so many different things to so many different people. And instead of trying to niche down within martial arts to say, you know, what martial arts is to me or what it has to be or should be, which, you know, those, those statements drive me insane. Mm -hmm. Just to celebrate the fact that martial arts really can and is be so many things. And that, the grammar on that sentence was terrible, but I, I think we know where <laughs> I was going. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like saying mm -hmm. music, right. you know, how many different kinds of music, if you say, I love music or I practice music, I mean, there are a lot of ways that you could take that just as with martial arts and yeah. Yeah. music or yeah. sports or yeah. Yeah, I words. Know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that for, um, I think for, uh, ex, you know, people who are uh, martial arts teachers or longtime practitioners or have been exposed to a very deep practice, it's not a surprise. Um, but, you know, the way uh, to hear that, um, the way that I have, that I approach it or that uh, a lot of people approach it is that martial arts are life art, as my teacher used to say. 
um, you know, and he would he would talk about how in older times that uh, if you know if there was a training a, a school of some kind, you learned how yes to defend yourself, but you also learned um, also how to heal um, and also some other art, uh, whether it was calligraphy or uh, painting or cooking or some or the highest of the arts meditation, um, so that there was it was an, a way of approaching uh, all of life. Um, and um, that kind, and you know, it's, this is not just an Eastern concept, it's kind of the, it's the, the theory, it's the philosophy behind the word gymnasium from ancient Greece. It was that the gym was a place where you went to develop body, heart, and mind. Um, and it's just like an old instinct. And to like try to bring everything together into one place to develop, not just a style or a technique, uh, but a person and an ethos, a culture. Um, and that's the, the, the higher function of, you know, of what it is to be a human being and the higher function of what this thing is of martial arts. Um, and so I come to it from that perspective. And I just want to say, you know, to listeners out there, yes, I'm a martial artist. I'm a martial arts teacher. I'm a Sifu. Yes, you, there are a lot of people out there who could take me. That there's no doubt I'm not a killer. I, it, that's, that's not how I approach things. I can take care of myself. Sure, you know, I'm, I'd be fine. I'd be okay. But, you know, it's, uh, in, in a lot of different kinds of circumstances. But if this was like, you know, an out and out, you know, tap me on the shoulder. I turn around, you tap the ground three times, like, uh, you know, waiting for me to react like Bruce Lee and get into a sparring match. Yeah, I'd probably, yeah, I probably would, you know, <laughs> be home, walking home. Um, but what I'm very good at is um, opening up um, people um, to uh, a journey that, uh, that they can embark on through movement that opens them up to different aspects of themselves, to uh, the different aspects of their, of their own psyche through movement, through breath, um, and through the archetypes of the system that I teach. Um, and that's it's my, it's my life's work. It's my life's joy. Um, and it's been really transformative for a lot of people. Um, so that's where I, I come to March. That's where I'm coming. Uh, that's where I'm coming from when it comes to teaching martial arts. Um, mm. um, the martial art that I teach um, is called Chen Long, and it's based on six animal archetypes. Um, and each of the different animals represents a different part of the mind, a different system of the body, uh, and a different way of moving, of, of self-defense, of different you know martial arts style, of course. But they all have different personalities as well. They have you know, favorite foods, music, clothing, um, and a different approach to physical fitness as well as to internal work and self-development. And so there's a whole cosmology to it, um, as well as, of course, different energy. Um, uh, you know, Eastern concept of energy, um, and um, uh, and so the. Um, what I do is that I help, I help people embody different aspects of themselves. So the idea is that everybody uh, possesses each of the animals with one or two that are stronger or more dominant. And so the, and usually only parts of those. So through, through the classes, they learn to embody the whole of themselves and, and how we do that. We, we do it by, you know, by adopting the character of the animal and then, you know, people role play you, you, listen to the music the, per the animal listens to, eat the food the animal eats and so on. And you do the meditation practices and, um, and the movement practices and you pay attention to the things in the world that that animal archetype would pay attention to in the way that it would pay attention. And people, and you, and you know, it's a, it's a process of just asking yourself questions, but there's a little bit of a structure, a little scaffolding around that that's bigger than just any one question you ask. Um, and, it, you know, the process guides you from one question to the next, next and that's the real, the real power of the system. Um, and what people discover about themselves helps them in every aspect of their lives, from, you know, interpersonal relationships to studies um, and, uh, you know, at school or at, at the performance at work. So that's the, that's the approach um, that, that we have here and that's what makes it a, a life art as well as a martial art. Um, so that's, and, um, yeah, um, there's a lot mm -hmm. in it and 
please, if you'd like to ask the question, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to let you go. You're making my job easy. <laughs> I, I want to go back to something. You said something that you admitted that I think a lot of martial arts admit privately, but not publicly. And that is that you're not a fighter. You know, there seems to be this, obviously there's this outside myth, you know, non-martial artists think that the pinnacle of martial arts is being this amazing fighter because that's what's presented to them in TV and movies and, and you know, in, in, in full contact events. Mm -hmm. But we know that that's not the goal. I mean, maybe for some, for some people, maybe that's the goal. But I think the vast majority, I don't know too many people who join a karate or taekwondo class and say, you know, I'm here because I, I want to be the world's greatest fighter. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I, my response diversity counts for so much. <laughs> I mean, diversity is really important, whether you're talking about immigration into a, a country um, or, you know, different perspectives in a company or in a laboratory. So uh, I'm, a, I'm also a cognitive psychologist. So I, I'm, a, I'm a professor. I lecture at a university. I teach uh, cognition, which is the science of how the mind processes information and generates the illusion of your reality. Um, I stats, stats, perception, introductory psychology. Um, and uh, it never ceases to astound me uh, the different paths and journeys that people take through life and the, the particular strengths that their journeys imbue them with. And the perspective that I bring to martial arts is very much like that of a research lab is that not, you know, you don't all have to be Einstein's in the fact that there are very few and far between of those kinds of really, truly talented people uh, who get all the ideas and you know, understand all the methods. Um, it's, okay. But what does happen is that you get people um, with their own particular strength and you get a few of them together and when you get them working as a team, what they can do collectively far surpasses what any one individually can do. Um, and it's, a, so it's the same thing for movement. It's the same thing for martial arts. Um, you know, yeah, sure, you can get uh, uh, Georges St. Pierre, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the big fighters in MMA, Bas Rattan, and yes, they're incredibly talented, very powerful, um, but, uh, but they also made it there because they had the support of a team, and each of them brought, you know, their own experience and their, their own talents to bear. And um, that, that, that piece of the conversation is missing very often um, in martial art in at, at the front line of martial art teaching um, that it's you know what makes you want to know what wins a fight discipline i mean throughout the history of war discipline is the is the most important weapon you know just talk to you know if you you know, just look at Roman history. It wasn't that the Romans were bigger or tougher. It wasn't that they had the better weapons or were meaner. It's just that they, they stayed in the phalanx and kept the line. Um, and they followed orders. Um, and uh, so there's that. Um, so, and uh, you lose a lot if your blinders are on only for um, that sort of, well, frankly, uh, psychologically immature warrior attitude, yes, but psychologically immature one. Um, uh, and I think that's an important element of the conversation is what is, is what's the, what is, what are the individual talents that a person is bringing? What part of them are, are they cultivating? Um, and how much, how much harder, are, well, not how much harder, but are they sincerely trying to improve themselves today compared to yesterday? Um, and if that's the conversation we can have, I think that there's a lot more, um, I think practice would be better. And I think access to teachers would also improve. Um, and, you know, it would cultivate a better uh, a culture, you know. And I think that's an important issue all, altogether. Like, um, you know, as martial, like you have a podcast and yes, you know, you, you are speaking to martial artists. And of course, you have to keep that focus. but 
you know, as a culture, what are we practicing for? Um, and that's a bigger question that we collectively have to ask ourselves. You know, we do our practice for ourselves. Yes, it's incredibly rewarding. Absolutely. The outside society, we ask, well, what can I give back? Or how, or at the very least, how can I get this out there more? And um, it's, you know, it's not by infomercials. It's by what do we have to offer society? What, what are the things that everybody in society is kind of wrestling with that we may have some insight and we may have something to say about? Um, and today, you know, the, the, we are living in interesting times. There's a political and environmental, you know, if you're, you're not thinking about and somehow incorporating in your martial arts, you're kind of missing the point of your own life in a way. I mean, that's a bit harsh, but you're kind of missing, um, well, an opportunity, an opportunity to get involved in a dialogue. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about the martial arts that I teach um, is that, you know, there's, you have the, these, these archetypal animals and they have ways of engaging one with themselves, of course, but also with other people and um, with the environment, with nature. So each of the animals represents also a different aspect of the earth. And, um, and this is, of course, not unique to this martial art, but it's just really explicit about it. And that where um, the part of the practice of nature, but also when you do the movement, incorporating visualizations about the elements into the movement, and when uh, doing uh, new meditation or the energy work, the Qigong kind of work, uh, visualizations about the elements uh, uh, figure very prominently, drawing energy directly from specific parts of the earth that relate to different systems of the body and also to different facets of the mind and the, the, the form of consciousness that that aspect of the mind represents. Um, so, for example, I should probably talk a little bit about the animal. Um, so there, there's three cats and three snakes, and there's, let's say, there's tiger, black panther, white leopard, and there's python, there's cobra, and there's boa. Um, and so let's say, take for example, tiger. So tiger represents the, the, the musculature of the body. It's physical power. It's the, um, the centers, the energetic centers are uh, the physical center, the danchan, the hara, um, manipura whatever system you want to call it, uh, the heart, uh, anahata, or the middle dantian, um, and the, the frontal lobes, the analytical mind. And this animal is about the aspect of consciousness of intent, willpower. And, um, you know, it's the muscles, it's, and it's not just any muscle, it's, but especially the big prime movers. Um, so the big, the shoulders, the delts, the glutes, the big lats of the body, these big prime movers, you call them muscle mirrors and bodybuilding. And, you know, in martial arts, they act as like, sometimes, you know, you use them as body armor. So it's the body armor part of the body. And the tiger resonates with the armor, if you will, of the earth, the, the mantle crust of the earth. And so each of the animals has a bow, um, a basic, you know, a uh, simple like breathe in, breathe out while you move your hands and your feet in a particular way. And with Tiger, it's, it's incredibly fierce. It's, it's the sun shin kind of style of breathing where it's, you know, very high resistant tension breath. Um, it's like, you know, you know, blowing air through, you know, it's like, it's like running a jet engine in a, in a mason jar. That's what it sounds like. Um, it's uh, very in intense breathing. And while you're doing the breathing, you're drawing energy, you're visualizing energy. Um, coming in from the mantle of the earth, you know, into the musculature, and you're using that sense of the, the plate and their friction against each other to, to embody the fierce concentration of the tiger's analytical mind. So that's, that's what this, that's how this art works. It, it connects the person, the individual, to their physical body, to their, their, their psyche, but also to the planet and the environment. Um, and it's one of the ways, and you know, this, it, that's how this art works, and it's one way that all art um, have of um, connecting um, an individual to a larger context. So, and it, it, so it's not just about strengthening me, but it's also about um, pro, uh, providing a purpose or a higher goal to the training. Um, and uh, this is a lot, I know, but um, 
there's a, I, I, and it's been, it's what I've done is that I, I've written a book all about all of this and it's called Unleash the Dragon Within. And it just came out in August and it's available um, on Amazon and, and good bookstores. And um, I, so I go into more detail on that or but just, you know, it's, it, it's all laid out. Um, but what I talk about in the book is that what every martial art has, whether you know it or not, every martial art has what I call uh, a mythos, a logos, and a morphos. Um, and with the, every martial art has a myth, has technique, and has something, a practice that helps you integrate the results of going through a conflict. Every martial art, whether you're a street fighter, you're MMA, you're Tai Chi, um, it doesn't matter. There's all, there, there are these three components. And if you don't think you have one, that's part of it. That's part of yours but they are all there. Um, the, the story of conflict is, uh, it, it, you know, it has these sort of three parts. So you have the, the myth. There's some sort of background worldview that, uh, that you, you learn. Uh, whether you think of this as like, you know, terms of engagement, if you're in the U.S. military, or, you know, we, do, you know, we fight or we do what we do, you know, to defend the Constitution. Um, that's their myth. If you're in a Chinese martial art, there's an entire cosmology about how the, uh, uh, the, the, the one becomes the two, becomes the three, becomes the 10,000, the yin and yang, the five elements um, uh, coming together. Uh, if you're in, uh, in Aikido, I'm a second degree black belt in Aikido, um, it's about um, finding harmony with the spiritual and divine forces and harmonizing with them. Um, if you're in MMA, there's an ethos, there's a, there is a warrior culture, uh, of humility and developing yourself and becoming the best that you can. Um, and if you're a street fighter, it's like, man, I was doing what I got to do to survive. Yeah, that's yours. Um, that's their, that's their mythos. Um, that's the world that they're coming from. Um, and we, you know, they don't, of course, this is, you know, we, we have this lovely word in psychology, all this is implicit. Uh, for, some, for some people, it's implicit. You, you, if you don't think you have one, think again. You just, you're walking around with it, you just don't know it. Um, and then that worldview translates into the technique. It informs the technique. You know, so, so again, yeah, um, with, you know, let's say U.S. military, um, you know, that logic of, you know, we have this very specific purpose and so when we go about doing anything, we analyze the costs and the benefits. Um, what are the trade-offs? Um, is it logistically feasible? Does it fit legally? Um, there's this in, in, incredibly important constitutional integrity. Um, uh, with the Chinese methods, um, they're inspired by nature. They look at they, they, the, the different elements represent different qualities, different ways, lengths. Um, and wave qualities of, of movements, all these different textures and attributes from relaxation to explosiveness, uh, timing and balance, and their techniques reflect that, that notion of wave, of wave-like dynamics. With um, Aikido, there's a, a, a spiraling harmony that's inspired by natural movement in the world and in the cosmos. Um, and with MMA, it's straight up, uh, you know, uh, techniques, um, no fuss, no muss, and, you know, no extra flourishes. And with street fighting, it's like you do what you got to do to survive. And that, you know, encompasses everything from trickery to, <laughs> to, um, to, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to spring like, you know, coil like, you know, action and, and no nonsense kind of, kind of moves. Um, and then there's, the morphos, the transformation, because the most important part of the fight is what happens afterwards. And we don't talk about that. Um, but you don't go through a conflict untouched. You can be unscathed, but you're not going to be unchanged. Um, and you need to integrate that experience into a tapestry, into a narrative that fits in the rest of your life and that elevates you and whatever cause it is that you've been fighting for, you, and usually the society around you. 
um, there's a process of transformation and everybody has a different way of transforming. And um, I guess it's just kind of funny. I mean, like we just take this for granted. Um, but, you know, um, whether you're pe people, people who have gone through a conflict somehow have to integrate that the story of that conflict back into their life. So that's the process of transformation. And there are different ways of doing that. And as a psychologist, I can speak to that from a psychological point of view. Um, but, you know, for, uh, and what's nice is that the animals capture the diversity that people have of approaching their own um, healing work or their own integrative work. Um, and, um, you know, so let's say for, um, you know, going back with, Tiger. So it's um, tiger. Is, you know, is very um, is is about willpower, um, and he's very simple, straightforward, and linear. Um, he the tiger operates from a very strong sense of integrity, um, and what it does, what it tries to do when it, it integrates, you know, experiences, is that it tries to um, it aligns itself with things of power. You know, it asks. Um, uh, it finds that uh, it, as, it, as it's gone through the journey of its life, it's developed uh, a, its personal sense of willpower, and it's always been based on its, you know, on Tiger's own ego. But as it gets more mature, it realizes that, that, that its own power is based on things that support it. So society, um, family, the, the planet, nature. And it starts to build not just, you know, a body and a heart and a mind, but you know, a building, an institution, a community, an organization that is founded on those same principles. And it uses the principles of its own physical development and practice as guiding principles in the community, you know. So you, you, you always meet these people, you know, they, you know, they've turned their, you know, a lot, a lot of why people go into martial arts is that they find that, you know, how you grow a body is, you know, how you grow a family, how you develop and cultivate uh, you know, the discipline that's required to maintain a practice is also the same kind of discipline that's needed to pursue uh, a career or, or a project goal. Um, and so they, the, the, their own practice becomes uh, a metaphor um, for integrating their, their life together in one cohesive whole. That's as, as one example. Um, and yeah, it's, it's the same. And again, same thing with every with every approach to martial art, they have different ways of that, that morpho stage, you know, so with, like, again, let's say with the military, it's like, you know, take care of your vets, you know, get them treated. Uh, we don't leave, you know, don't leave uh, a man behind. Um, we do that in the Marines and we do that as a society. No, there shouldn't be people homeless on the street. Um, we don't leave a man behind. Um, and if you're in, uh, you know, like Chinese, uh, in Chinese martial arts, they have an incredibly rich uh, uh, medical practice, you know, partially so that they can help fix up, you know, their training partners so they can continue training. But, you know, also so that they, the idea being that if you cause damage, you should be able to fix it, you know. Um, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a higher level of practice um, with Aikido. Um, there's a Shintoistic, there's a Shinto practice, uh, you know, devotional uh, chanting and purification, just like any religion, uh, you you have your, may uh, cult is a bit strong, but you know, you have some way of making atonement and seeking um, a higher, higher meaning afterwards. Um, MMA, I, I, I don't know, not to speak too broadly or too brush, too big a brush stroke, but you know, there's, you know, what do you do after you've had your career? Maybe it's endorsements, maybe it's your career goes into teaching others. Um, and even in street fighting, there's, there's maybe it's a bit, it might be nihilistic. You might have a sort of nihilistic philosophy. Yeah, it's dog eat dog, you know, it's whatever you can get, whatever angle. Well, that's your way of integrating the story. Um, that's your way of transforming and integrating the narrative into a larger context. Um, so, and it's not just martial arts that have this way of approaching their work. It's any field, really. Um, and what, um, and what, and with martial arts, it's just really explicit. <laughs> it's just, it's just mm. there's something irrevocable 
Um, and we respond to that on a very basic level. Um, and I guess I should just give examples because I'm a teacher and that's what I do compulsively. But, you know, if you're going in, you know, <laughs> if you're if you're a chef, there's a there's there's that worldview. There's the technique. And then there's the integration. You know, your worldview is, you know, this is these are the ingredients. This is how they fit. This is our history. You know, we were you know, we lived in this place. We were conquered by these people and we absorbed their culinary habits. And this is how you cook it. And we put the meal down on the table and we sing. Or we put the meal down on the table, we eat as quick as we can, and we leave. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's like you integrate the, the, the meal as part of a larger context, and it serves a, a, a bigger story. Uh, musician, dancer, whatever it is, there's a, a, a view you're coming from. There are techniques that uh, are an extension of that worldview. And then after the deed is done, the work is, um, is, is finished, and you've gone, if it if you've been through any kind of conflict where there is a tension of opposites, where there has been a, a, a struggle and you come out somewhat with a somewhat change, you have to do the extra work as a human being of integrating, of recognizing that change. We do this automatically. Um, and that's the, that's the morphos part. That's the part of the transformation. And you have to allow that change to occur. And if you stop it, you try to stop it. If you try to go back to who you were before the conflict, before your trial, your odyssey, your challenge, it's not going to work. It's going to backfire, in fact. Um, so you have to move forward with it. And, um, and it's just that much, again, as I was saying, it's, it's just that much more explicit in the context of a physical conflict, but it's no different. Uh, conflict is conflict, regardless of whether it's physical, psychological, social, political, economic, whatever it is. Um, I, yeah. I want to jump in if I may. Yeah, please do. Because you, you're, you're <laughs> connecting dots in a, in a way that just, it, I, I'm over here nodding. I'm doing a lot of nodding. And we've certainly had folks on the show who have, you know, put forth some, some of what you're saying, but I don't think we've ever had anyone, and I've certainly never heard anyone, talk about these things the way that you are. I want to go back. I want to, I want to roll way, way back because at some point, I mean, you've got the academic side, you've got the martial arts side, and, and I'm going to guess the martial arts came first and uh, you pursued yeah. the academics in, in, in at least part to understand some of the things that you were exploring in the martial arts. Am I right yeah, there? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that, yeah, broad enough stroke. Yeah, sure. Okay. Would, would you mind talking about that? piece i mean may, maybe a a survey of of how you got started in martial arts but I'm, I'm really interested about the academic side of this and how you started to connect these dots because you're talking about the animals you're talking about tiger in a way that i've not heard anyone talk about and i'm fascinated excellent <laughs> that's a that's a good sign um <laughs> yeah i'm not asleep over here no 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 that's that's great no um I have to think about, so you want to know like, like where the, the point of view came from? It's, it's probably more a period of time. Let me, let, me, let me say it in a different way. Let me ask this in a slightly different fashion. Oh. The majority of people who train martial arts hear what their instructors say. They internalize it. Maybe they'll come to a slightly different interpretation of it. And some of them will just continue to practice in that way with that understanding. A few of them will pass it on more or less verbatim to their own students. But once in a while, you get someone who, as I say, advances martial arts, someone who takes the things that they've learned and they become hellbent on understanding it at a deeper level in a different way they're training in other martial arts, maybe they're pursuing academics that will help them understand mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you are one of those, those knowledge seekers, those advancers. And at some point, some light bulb went on for you somewhere to say, there's more, and I want to know what it is. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I, first of all, thanks. That, that, uh, so it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a lovely reflection. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, I'm not normal. Um, <laughs> uh, unsurprising. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit different. What can I say? Um, yeah, um, it's, you know, again, the diversity and, you know, talk about neurodiversity. Um, it, everybody brings a different perspective. Um, and every, um, you know, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, how does that, so, you know, who, uh, and, and that's the, and that's the big question of this art is who are you? Uh, what are you, what are you bringing? Uh, where are you going to be moving to? Where are you moving from? Where are you moving to? Those are all the big fundamental questions. And that's, that is what, you know, my teacher excelled at. Um, he was, uh, I could not possibly unentangle all the things that I'm talking about. Yeah, I did. I did take them a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I did extend them. I explored them. I filled them in, I, I, you know, and so on. Uh, but by God, it was because we had one hell of a teacher who was like uh, a, a great, you know, a, a great example of the kind of exploration um, that he was talking about. Um, uh, and it was just relentless. And so you, we just, you know, just sucked it in by osmosis. Um, and his name was uh, Constantine Darling. And he was, uh, he was, he grew up in New York. Um, he picked up all sorts of, he had, you know, the way that he tells the story. And I talk about it in the book. Um, you know, he grew up with the name Connie Darling and he liked dance. Um, and so he'd go to ballet school with his, you know, dance slippers. And he lived in Harlem in, you know, so, uh, uh, sorry, Queens in New York. And, you know, so he'd be, you know, he'd be going to dance class with his dance shoes and then be getting into fights. Like, ah, Connie, darling. Yeah, like, boom. Um, and so he had to fight. And uh, at one point, um, he, he came home bloody after some kid had beat him up, beat him up. And his father <laughs> uh, took him to it, um, you know, uh, punch, you know, you know, hit him around and said, you don't come back into the house until you've got the blood of the kid who did this on your fist. And he went out and he did, and he came back and that started his interest in martial arts. And, um, he got into all, uh, a lot of them, different ones. And he came across this one, this art Chen Lung. Um, and, um, uh, and then, you know, this was, you know, just Vietnam happened. He became a conscientious objector, uh, objector um, and um, he realized that, you know, he wasn't going to want to kill anybody that hadn't done anything to him, you know, like Muhammad Ali kind of thing. And uh, uh, all sorts of things happened there. He got court-martialed on the way to the brig. The one only friend that he had left um, was the guy driving the truck. He drove it into a ditch or, uh, or took some last exit before the, the military prison and on to an airport and tell him, you know, get out of the country, just leave. So he came to Canada, opened up dance studios and uh, dance companies and made his way out to Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, I met him in Montreal and I went to go train with him in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, and the martial art that he taught, the Chinlong, became this sort of, uh, you know, we have um, this sort of like coat rack, if you will, where he could hang all these other ideas about spiritual and personal development. Um, and yo, he was, he was, he was larger than life. The second day I met him at an improv workshop, a dear friend and still, uh, you know, still my teacher, Barbara Pogmiller and improvisation had called me up, uh, and invited me to a workshop. And on the second day of the workshop, he reminded one of the other participants of a dream she had had the night before this, this was stuff he was doing all, all the time. It was just ridiculous. People had all these kinds of stories of seeing him altered, like shape shift, basically. Um, or no stuff that he had no business knowing. Um, things like that. And, um, so, and I was young and I was inspired by that. I was, you know, beyond, I was mystified, intrigued. I was hooked. Um, I, you know, I remembered during these workshops, you know, he talked about the animals, you know, these three animals, there's three cats, three snakes, the cats are masculine, the snakes are feminine, you marry a cat, you marry it and integrate a cat with a snake, you create the dragon and the dragon says yes to all of life. And that was it. I was hooked. Um, and it was the, this, this archetypal power that just like reached in and pulled 
on the on the strings of my imagination and my intellect. And, you know, I guess, you know, you can't understand, you know, you're asking the question, how did I get into this? Why, what, what pushed me on this journey? And is the, you know, it was, it was the, the, the pain of my own personal upbringing. Um, um, you know, there were, there, it was, uh, I had a childhood that was, um, eventful that was, um, that had its, its own stresses. Um, and, um, in the martial art, I found a vehicle that could help me make up for some of the um, lost opportunities of growing in certain ways, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Um, and I, yeah, yeah, I've got a brain. Yeah. And so I needed something that had some legs on it to like keep, to help my, you know, get my mind some exercise. Uh, something with imagination as well as with with structure or logic and internal logic to it. Um, and I, that, and the system was it. It just, I just got hook, hook, line and sinker. Um, and, um, my father, you know, I, other pieces of the puzzle. Yes, yeah, sure. My father was a surgeon. So the, you know, the focus on the physical body from the point of view of different systems, it just seemed to naturally fit and made sense. Um, things like that. Um, and what else can I say about this? Um, yeah, that's the, that's the personal background that I was coming with. Um, How long did it take you to realize that your exposure <coughs> to this individual was not typical? I was pretty damn that young. Martial artist. Point. Um, yeah. It's, you know, one of those things, you know, and it, it's not an uncommon story. You, know, you talk to any person who's had like a really strong mentor. You don't know. That's the beauty, right, of, of youth is that you don't know. <laughs> um, and um, it becomes your, um, your, your, origin, your origin story, right? Um, uh, Connie used to call it your, your entry point. Um, but there's, there's a whole... There's a whole bunch of sociological, psychological, uh, interpersonal dynamics that are all bundled together, like some sort of like you know, <laughs> uh, proto fetal kind of way, um, and you can't untangle it. You're not supposed to untangle it. It's supposed to like just all be one big blob, and then as you move, it starts to take shape. Um, um, no, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't appreciate. I, I don't think I really knew until. <laughs> 10, 12, 15 years later, I could really appreciate it. Um, when I went back to school, when I went back to college, um, I, I, that was the beginning of appreciating much more what, what, it, what, it, what I had gone through. Um, what would happen, you know, so Connie was like, and he was incredibly foresightful. Um, there was something to what he was, you know, to his, to his practices. And he seemed to like, he would talk about things in the nineties that then we would find in research in the aught years and, you know, in the 2000 and, you know, mid years, early years, um, things uh, through research that would, you know, pan out. It's like, how the hell did you know this? Um, <laughs> that was going on all the time. Um, but then also, you know, as I was, you know, taking my, you know, uh, my getting my degree in psychology, you know, I'd encounter, you know, different theories and schools of thought, you know, like, you know you're Freudian, you're humanistic, you're, Jungian social construct and all that. And at every turn, I was like, oh, that's what Connie was talking about. Oh, that's what he was talking about. Oh, that's what he was talking about. And um, it, it, there was um, you, that kind of, it's hard to pin, it's hard to explain this, but he was, he was so, he wasn't just a fighter, physical fighter. Um, he was also an intellectually engaged individual. Um, and um, that's just as an, an important part, as much an important part in your training as, as, as the push-ups. You, you have to read. You have to be exposed to new ideas and new perspectives. They will inform your training at, at every level, at every turn. Um, um, you know, you, it's not rumination. You don't, you don't, get, don't, don't get stuck in your head, but uh, keep your imagination alive. Keep your imagination enthralled. Um, Keep asking, you know, what about this? What if? Um, and that's what that's what he excelled at. Um, and so I, I got to see that 
um, in, I got to see that more in a structured way and in a very informed way uh, in college. I mean, we talk about college as being this you know, repository of ideas. Yes, but it's also a collective history of thinking. And you get to, you get exposed, hopefully, if you have a good professor, you get exposed to all the previous mistakes as well. Um, and, um, and the stories <laughs> of surrounding making those mistakes. Um, and that's, um, that's just, that, 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 that gave me a, a structure. And so I could tease apart ideas and results separate from the process. Um, so I could tease apart my own process from the results I'd gotten. And that was an important um, step along the way. Um, and I think that's an important element. I think that's something that people confuse very often, like the, the goal, the goal, the, the, yeah, the goal with the process, the, the destination with the journey. Um, those are two very separate things. Uh, and again, the animals become really cool metaphors for that. Um, so like, again, with each of these animals, these are archetypes um, and they are, you know, you have this word from Jungian psychology, they're transgressive. So they are symbols, but they're not like math symbols where the symbol means one thing and one thing only. They are symbols that can be applied to many different things. Um, so, um, so you can, like going back, to, you know, you can be a tiger, uh, you can be a tiger type of person. You can be doing a Python kind of profession, but you could be doing it in a leopard sort of manner. Um, you can have somebody like Bruce Lee. So Bruce Lee, really fantastic tiger physique, but he's a white leopard person. He's, he's a little bit, um, there's, uh, there's uh, yes, he had tremendous power, but the, the speed was not a tiger speed. It was a leopard speed. The philosophical viewpoint that he had about martial arts that he tried to communicate through Jeet Kune Do was a, a leopard kind of philosophy. Um, that's, you know, that's an example. Um, and so uh, very, and the animals become a really useful language to help a person be able to pull apart these different elements of their lives, you know, what they are doing, how they are doing it, and how does that jive with their true nature with who they are uh, as a person. Um, and, that and that was always a part of, of, of our practice. Another big part of our practice, and we, the idea was to apply the animals, these archetypes to ourselves, you know? So what's my tiger? What's my panther? What's my cobra? What's my python? What's my boa? And am I honest about it? Um, um, so the tiger represents willpower. The, uh, the panther represents instinct and sensuality. Uh, it rep, um, and um, I mean, just just like Freud, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that that have issues with their own sensuality or their own body. Um, you know, if you taught a martial arts class, there are a lot of young ladies who, uh, for that matter, young men who come to a class, but, and they they have a relationship with their own bodies that is not healthy, that is not ideal. Um, never mind body shape, just not trusting their bodies. Um, and that could be due to a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and, and the panther would then become a way, uh, a vehicle, an, um, a psychological vehicle that they could then engage when they would have a language by which to have a conversation about those issues in their life, sensuality, um, um, and trusting their own gut sense, their own you know, bodily intelligence. There's uh, boa, and the boa is the unconscious, it's empathy. It's, in, it's like Tai Chi um, uh, in terms of its fluidity, its softness, and the incredible power that comes with that softness. It's the feminine archetype. Um, you know, you, the more you fill it up, the larger it gets. It's yielding and, um, and soft. And how many people um, have a, a, a difficult relationship with their own feminine side with their own softness. I mean, there's plenty of classes that I've taught where I, you know, I'll, I'll hear it um, from young ladies. Sometimes, you know, I, I have, you know, I, I don't trust my feminine side as, as an example. I don't know what it means to be, you know, uh, a feminine woman, for example. Um, and the bow would then become a, a vehicle by which to explore that issue in the society and why why is that even an issue? Because this society doesn't really value femininity. 
um, is very hostile, as you know, as recent history has clearly shown um, that you know this is not a safe place for being a woman. I mean, I you know, um, you know, I've got 16 year olds. You know, after you know the last uh, election, were like asking, you know, how soon can I leave the state? <laughs> it's like literally. Um, and there's a com- there's a co- there's an important conversation there, and um, it's and it's not just about uh, you know equality. It's not just about allowing young. It's not just about allowing women to be equal as men to be you know to develop their masculine side and act with equality and be treated the same way as men do. It's about treating femininity equal with the same amount of regard as masculinity is held. Um, it's it's. It's not about the sex, it's about the psychology, it's about the gender, it's about the psyche. Um, and and BOA, the, the, the BOA, you know, you introduce them to the, to the idea, the concept of the BOA, and it gives them a vehicle to explore the, uh, the power of gentleness and the gentleness of true power. Um, and then, you know, so then there's, uh, gosh, pick one, pick one, Python. So then there's Python, and Python is, uh, it's it's about strategy. It's about structure. It represents the skeletal system in terms of martial arts. It's your bone breaking kinds of styles. Uh, those those magical techniques where you know you just flick your wrist a little bit and you feel this resounding, shuddering impact drive down through your body like a, a ball going through a pinball machine. Um, it manipulates structure. So it under and it studies. So it studies patterns and then manipulate what it understands and um i can tell you as a psychologist yeah the, we as human beings that's what we do we are pattern detectors and then we are compelled to impose meaning on those patterns um there's a term for it the interpreter and like we can talk neuroscience later but uh, but that's what we do we try to impose meaning on patterns whether those patterns are actually due to nature, or they're just random patterns. You, you will try to, uh, or random events, we'll just try to impose meaning on those random events. That's what we do, we create meaning. And that's what the Python represents. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, and, and so on. So uh, the, the leopard is intuitive, it's creative, the cobra is psychic, um, and, um, right, and that's, that's, that's all six of them. And, yeah, and, uh, the same thing, and again, the cats are masculine archetypes, the snakes are feminine archetypes, and the idea is you integrate them. So they are, they are really, there. there's, of course, some overlap among them, um, but they also, when you, what I do in my classes is that um, I, I emphasize, I focus on the individual archetypes, the animal archetypes, um, and make sure that a student is well-versed, well-rounded, can embody each of the animals really powerfully really make it something and um uh and then then what you do is you you and you start with the animal you're you're naturally most uh, aligned with um and you round it out and you really develop it and then what you do is you go to its opposite animal and you explore that one and and you bring it up to the equivalent level of strength and then what happens is that by then of course there is a sort of the, the work starts taking on a momentum of its own already a little bit, but really once you start exploring the opposite animal, uh, there's really a synergy that starts to happen. The practice starts to have a life of its own. Things start to develop um, on their own steam. And um, the, you, there's, um, there's an inherent shock in transitioning. So I talk about this a little bit in the book near the end about how the, the process of dragging begins. And, one of the things that happens is that you, you get a sort of like um, ontological shock. It's a fancy way of saying, uh, you know, a sort of culture shock for one, if you will. Uh, your uh, table for one, please. Um, and I, I remember having that experience myself, like where I'd been practicing Tiger a lot. Like I got to the point where, you know, I was scaring some of the other people with how intense I was being about it. And I, it was halfway through a class and Connie just turned to me and he said, OK, be Boa right now. And I did. And I had this spontaneous, unexpected sense of being seasick. It, it was because uh, it meant something to me. I took it seriously and I did do the switch. And oh my God, I was like nauseous. I was a little bit dizzy. And it took me a while to figure out, oh, it, it was like culture shock for one person. I, 
I'd invested so much energy and time into the tiger that when I switched, I sort of pulled a psychological rug from out underneath my foot, my feet. And, you know, I'd gone from being like, you know, very focused and hard and, 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 and fiery. And I went boa, which was, you know, soft and omnidirectional and, and long wavelength. And um, it, w- it was just disconcerting. Um, and, and there, so there was, there was that, that kind of shock, that, and it's like a culture shock. It's like going to a different place. And um, you're having to respond to the environment in a different way, but it also brings out something different in you. And you're, you don't know how to orient yourself, you know. Um, there's a part of you that wakes up when you travel to places. Um, and that can be good. That can also be disconcerting. Um, and that's what had happened. And it had happened in a room. It had happened in a split second. And it didn't, nothing else had changed. It was me. It was me within myself. And um, so that was a really Im- important insight. Like, so if you ask, you know, where does this perspective come from? It's like, well, it comes from the, the real experience of if I just change how I'm thinking and approaching the world, I can, I, I can radically change. <laughs> I'm, I'm ra- I, if I do that, I am radically changing myself. Um, and it's not about, you know, what somebody says or does to me, whether they punch me or call me some sort of ethnic slur. It's not whether they're cheating me, you know, in business or as an employee, none of that has to happen. I just have to change myself from the inside and my world radically changes. Um, That's a profound insight. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want to, I want to take a step back. I want to look at this from a, from a slightly different angle, because what you've, you've done is you've told us, you know, a a lot about you and your training and and the way you teach Mm -hmm. and fascinating stuff. And I'm sure, you know, like me, a lot of the listeners are, you know, nodding their head saying, yeah, this sounds great, but I don't train there. And a lot of the folks we have listening aren't engaged in Chinese styles that differentiate by animal. You know, we've got a lot of people who are karate practitioners, or Taekwondo practitioners, or Filipino martial arts practitioners. Right. And maybe this is a segue into the book. Maybe it's not. But how do you take this, this segmentation? this understanding of different ways that you can train and, and examine yourself and apply that knowledge. How can we apply that understanding or, or seek that understanding within non-Chinese arts without, you know, through, through arts that are not under your tutelage? Right. Yeah. And yeah, of course, you know, yes, the book could be helpful for that. Uh, obviously, you can then you can check out the the website sixanimalskungfu.com, dot com, um, and you might find some material there that'll be helpful. Um, for, you know, first talk to your teacher. <laughs> um, you can always reach out to me if you have questions about any of this stuff related to the animal archetypes. Um, but I don't think that um, any I, there none of the art, especially the traditional arts. Uh, lack this kind of background. They talk about the psyche. They talk about the body. They 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 and they talk about interaction. You you just have to ask, um, you know, and you just have to start the conversation. Honestly, it's not like this knowledge is hidden. It it really isn't, and it's not just me. It is out there. It's just that it 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 does take work. That's the thing. Uh, and by work, I mean, yes, the work of practicing and applying it, but the work also of asking about it, investigating, searching for it, calling for it. Um, and that's, and that's mostly what it is. Um, it, it, it's not inaccessible. Um, the, um, so what else? yeah, that's, that would be my response. Um, and then if you're looking for like more guidance, then absolutely like, um, to start with, Start with the body. Um, you know what are the different systems? How do they work? And what's the intrinsic um, intelligence, or what's the insight? What's the what's the fundamental insight that you gain by understanding how this particular system of the body works? You know, so um, you know, the heart. What does it do? Yeah. It pumps blood throughout the entire body. The whole body? Yeah. No cell is too small. Um, and that's a lovely little principle and metaphor 
you know, the, 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 you know, about, you know, government, the government takes care of every citizen of every person, um, with, we you know within its bound, within its boundaries and ideally outside of its own boundaries. Um, it, so there's, there's that principle and there's that insight. Um, and, um, you, when you get those insights, you, you write them down, uh, you, you, you take them in, you contemplate them, uh, you try to make them a part of, of your practice and you go back and forth, you know, uh, what insight do you get from the body? How does it extend to something outside in the real world? How does an interaction outside in the real world, what kind of insight does that give me about perhaps how the body works? Um, uh, what else? Um, basic practice, the breath, follow your breath. Um, I talk about this in the book, seven steps. So these are internal steps and practices that you can use to adopt the animal perspectives, but they apply to any art. Um, so, and common to all arts is follow your breath. And that means uh, that can mean different, uh, different things or different strategies with that. Um, so there's, you know, like in Western psychology, you, you're, it's, uh, it's a mindfulness practice where you're neutrally witnessing the breath uh, coming in and going out. And, but in Eastern practices, following the breath is also a little bit more active. It, does, it incorporates that, but it's also a little bit more active where you're visualizing the breath going to different parts of the body. And you notice how, you notice how you're breathing. And if I was a character in a play and I was breathing this way, what, the, what would that say about my character? That kind of thing. Um, and so you, you observe it. Or sometimes you deliberately control it. I'm breathing shallow right now in a shallow way. Let me take a deep breath. Um, and uh, so starting with the breath, that's a, that's a big one. And then um, mental cognitive practices. Um, every art um, has a sort of meditative or contemplative practice. Um, and I encourage people to explore them. They're there for a reason, and if you're, and that's the other thing too. Like you're, this the, the the premise that you that you that we sort of started this conversation with was, hey, I'm not here, I'm not there. Um, there's a, a lack involved in there. No, you are where you are right now. Maybe there's a purpose to that. Um, um, so, so start where you are with what you've got, kind of thing, and. Um, when it comes to, and right, and I'm sure that where you are, what you've got, there's some, there's going to be easily accessible, some kind of practice that is internal and meditative and contemplative at your disposal. Explore it. Um, ask about it. Um, try it out. Um, that getting quiet is the first step. Being able to follow your breath and get quiet mentally is the first step. And that's the, a great place to start. Um, getting connected to your body through your breath, getting connected to your body. Um, and then, uh, yeah, for me, it goes from, from the body to movement. So that's my thing. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I, if I were to give a, a short, concise answer, I would say that start there, start with the breath and connect to your body. Your mind will follow. Tell us more about the book. You know, what, what would, I mean, you've, you've talked a little bit about it, hinted at it, and, you know, why, why did you write it? Let's start I there. had to. I had to. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> um, Anyone out there who's written a book understands. I, I, I get it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, um, I, the, you know, Constantine, my teacher, had touched a lot of people's lives. Um, there were a lot of people who regarded him as, like, you know, you know, their favorite or greatest teacher they'd encountered in their lives. Um, and, but I was like the one person who'd taken the whole system in, who like learned all the forms, learned all the practices, um, so that I could teach them down. And, um, and there've been other people who are, you know, prominent here and there. Um, uh, but I kind of fell on my shoulders to pass it on. And, uh, this was the best way I knew how. Um, I know this is the age of YouTube and so on, but it, for me, it seemed to be more important to get the the ideas, the philosophy, the, the structure down on paper. Um, so, 
so that a person could like, you know, pick up a book and digest it. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I had to pass it on. This stuff, you know, has, I don't know, without sounding too dramatic, you know, it saved my life. And I want to pay it forward. I want to pay it back. I want to give it back. Um, give the gift back. So, uh, yeah, I just, I could not. I mean, there were times I kept wondering, why am I trying to write this? this is, no, nobody, nobody else knows about this. It's not going to inform anybody else. And why don't I just try and stop? And I, you know, I, it would last like 10 seconds. <laughs> it was like, um, <laughs> it, um, yeah, no, I had to write it. Um, I think the reason why, the reason why is that it's, um, I think it's a, you know, we're facing a real and, and real challenges today, again, environmentally, politically, socially, um, and the solutions that we will implement, they will be, yes, they will involve technology um, to some extent, but, and they will also involve, you know, social organization in some levels. It's just, you know, a question of political will. Um, but along the way, there is, there are changes that we need to make in our behavior. There are insights we need to have in terms of ourselves as individuals and how we relate as people. So much of our fear of other people is based on uh, fears or, um, uh, uh, or, or doubt or confusion that we have about ourselves. And we just put it on other people. We put it on the other. Um, and um, I, it, we, part of the process, part of the solutions, you know, to solving the climate uh, crisis will, will, will involve a little bit of self-examination uh, and introspection. What kind of habits do we really need to continue, what kind of habits can we let go? Uh, what kind of you know <clears throat> behaviors can we let go? Um, and um, there, people are going to confront fear as they do this. And martial arts is one of the vehicles where there is, in the hands of a good teacher, there is a structure by which you can confront a personal fear that you have and transcend it tra and transform through it. Um, you know. Um, Mo, you know, most people are just terrified. Most people are terrified of their own feelings. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, having a, an anger reaction that that they feel is overpowerful, or feeling so, so sad that they don't think anybody could possibly understand them, or you know, uh, even celebration. I feeling a sense of euphoria and excitement about life that they just don't know how to contain at times. Uh, people are some people. Some you know, there's a sort of emotional existential threat they feel from their own their own lives and they don't know that they can survive their own feelings. And the purpose of archetypes, you know, the work of of you know of Jung and all these great psychologists was that no, of course, it's coming from within you. Of course you're most, you know, yeah, I say this with certain caveats because things can get complicated, but but yes, if it's if these feelings are coming from within you, then yeah, you have the tools to be able to metabolize those feelings. And um, we've got a lot of problems to solve and um, feelings are going to come up and we need the tools to deal with those feelings. Um, and maybe it's this archetypal system, maybe it's therapy, maybe it's art, whatever, but get there. Um, and if the system um, encourages people to start, you know, start doing that, start doing that exploration, and for some people, it makes it fun and makes it interesting and makes it integrative. All the more power to it. Like, hallelujah, let's do this. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, why else did I write this? Because if on a very fundamental basis, um, every individual is inextricably intertwined with their society and with the environment, with the ecology, with the, you know, the, the oxygen that a tree produces and consumes the carbon dioxide that it consumes to the, the water a person consumes, the food they consume, and, and then, you know, how we, you know, defecate and put that energy and matter back into the ecosystem. We are intertwined with nature. We are inextricable. And this system is, is based on that assumption. And I think that's an important way of thinking that the times uh, demand of us, that we are not um, you know, that th we're not man in control and uh, 
molding nature, we are a part of a system. Um, and what we do affects that system, and that system will then affect us in response. Um, and that's not a scary thing. That's a, that's a be- that has the potential of being a beautiful dance. Um, you know, it, it's a, and that's what the dragon is about. It's about, um, is about that confrontation, w- which then turns into a dance, um, and into a celebration as, um, it, as you become more aware of the intricacies of who you are, you know, that the animal symbolize, you know, um, you, you, it's like being a musician, you, like you become really, um, uh, well-versed in, in music and that when you go to listen to it, you can appreciate all the nuances. And it's sort of the same thing. What martial arts gives us is a way of appreciating all the nuances of conflict. And it's not just the fighting, it's the, the beautiful resolution between tensions and opposites and, and all the different dynamics you can find in that. And it's a, it's a gorgeous, never-ending story. Um, and, but you can't get there if you're always afraid of it. And so how do you get over the fear? Well, through your breathing, um, through, through the movement, um, through awareness of your body, um, and having multiple facets of approaching that practice, well, that, that's key um, because you know, we're, we're complicated animals. So you, you can't ignore the complexity. Um, and you go with the flow, right? Um, that's another, that's another um, I mentioned to it. I think I'm rambling a little bit here. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> it's a hallmark of the show. I, I never <laughs> consider it rambling. It's, it's being tangential. Right. right. Um, but, but this is, this is all, this is all great stuff. This, re- this really is. And, and I, I want to, I want to start to, you know, close some of these, these lines of conversation <laughs> up as, as right. we wind down, right. because unfortunately we do have a, a finite amount of time that we can talk. And so I want, I want to kind of flip this. You know, we've talked about now, we've talked about the past, and, and, and it's clear that there's a, a very powerful, I don't know if I want to say force or trajectory, but there's something that, there's a very strong passion in everything that you've talked about today. And, yeah. and, and that's really resonating for me. And I, I think oh, if great. nothing else, people are picking up on that. But let's, let's look to the future, right? So, because I, I think there's always something very telling when I ask this question, when you look at your future, what do you see coming down the pipe? You know, if you're looking out a year, five years, 20 years, however far out you want to look, what's next? Well, the first word that comes to mind is the practice. I mean, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. That's not going to stop. And you know, I'm going to keep teaching and I will go through, you know, what we all, what all teachers go through in terms of, you know, having students and, and disseminating it and keeping the the flame alive and passing it on. That's, that's the, that's the calling, right? You, so there's that. Um, do I have any like sort of big business plans? <laughs> uh, you know, if it's, if I'm called upon to like, you know, teach larger classes, that's great. Um, and, um, and if not, there's so much for me, if, if I'm not, there's still so much more to, to explore and to learn. I mean, so what I want to right now, so I guess in a, in a, a quick kind of image, um, what would be the, what the future holds for me is uh, growing this, you know, getting the, the system out there, um, but, and more importantly, getting the ideas out there, um, talking to people, to other martial artists, and, you know, maybe, you know, they don't have to be doing this system. They don't have to be doing this art with me. Um, but if the ideas that we're talking about are useful, I'm, I'm ecstatic. Mission accomplished. You know, so if you take the ideas of the mythos, the morphos, and the logos, and you're looking at your practice from that point of view, what's my background? How's the technique and an extension of the background? How am I transforming and integrating each of these experiences? And that changes your practice. That's awesome. Um, the if you look at the animals and you're fascinated, or you've never looked at your physical practice from the perspective of each one of your physio- physiological systems, that will that will that will add a level of depth to your practice um, 
and open avenues that it, that are fantastic. And that if that happens, that's awesome. I would I would love for that to happen. And um, you know, and people can dabble. They can take a little piece of this and that from the you know some of the ideas from the book or the system and adapt it to their own. And what I what I want to see is I um is it's much less about for me it's more about us <laughs> um it, is to have a conversation of, uh, about martial arts that is broader deeper that is less um the, uh, that is less about the 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 fighting and the violence or you know have that of course have it you know, and, and talk about it in terms of technique and intelligently of course but also have a broader conversation about what it is that this as a community that martial artists as a community have to offer the the other communities the the rest of society um and um you know there there's a you know you know, my father's a surgeon and doctors have this kind of like a humble respect. Good doctors have this like humble respect and reverence for the, you know, the magic and the wonder of the physical body and its ability to heal and its intricate complexity. And um, martial arts also have a similar regard that's like really down to earth kind of reality check that we have with physical training and, you know, pain, you know, getting, getting hurt here or there, getting into a lock and the sort of um, undeniable reality of the physical body. And we dancers have it too, you know, it comes back down to like what's happening physically and it, it keeps things not, not simple, but honest. Um, and um, it, that, that's an important reminder that the remind, reminding the rest of society of the integrity that is involved in having an animal like body <laughs> of having an, a soft animal of a body. Um, this is, it's an important reminder. It's so easy to get lost or forget or abstracted away um, that things come back down that all of, all of this, um, all of this stuff around us comes back down to very to simple principles. Um, that have to be applied with extreme care and attention. So simple, but not easy. Um, and so having that conversation, having this conversation where as martial artists, we have something to offer the rest of society. Um, and um, it's, it's through this practice where the mind, the body, and the heart and the spirit meet. Um, and it's a place where... Um, the knowledge you encounter, you know, in a book, in math, in history, um, can um, interface can be expressed um, through through movement, um, and that's what I would say about the future. Is we need to open up the conversation. We need to make this more than just about ourselves as individuals. Uh, we need to um, um, bring it to a larger, to a larger audience, um, to, a, uh, and address, um, underlying, yeah, address the underlying issues that we are all facing together commonly in common. Good stuff. Yeah. Where can people find you online? You know, the book, website, social yeah. media, any of that? Um, we are, I'm at, uh, www six animals kung fu and uh, I can be reached at info at six animals dot com um, so the, to the website you can you can reach out um, there's some basic information on the website about the animals and the archetypes um, there's also a personality quiz that you can take to find out which animals you're strongest in. Then you can read the descriptions uh, on the website and you can also then order the book to read about the animals in the book and find out more about you know, how you can develop different aspects of your, of your own animals. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm also doing a, um, 
I've done a bit of a book tour, and my next uh, stop, so we are in 2019, for those of you who listen to this podcast and some other year. Um, and November 21st, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Boulder, Colorado, Thursday, 7.30 p.m., 21st of November, uh, doing a book talk there, and I'll also be doing a little uh, workshop at the uh, Boulder Main Library the next day on the Friday. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm available. Uh, what I'd like to do um, is is do workshops. Um, I also uh, provide, uh, like, lifestyle coaching consultation based on the animals. So if people are interested in that, they can reach out reach out for that. Um, yeah, and hit me up. Let's do a workshop. Dancers, gymnasts, yogis, other martial artists. Um, you know, you listen to the podcast, so now you know what you'd be getting. <laughs> cool. Great stuff. Now we ask all of our guests to send us out into the outro in, in the same way, and that is what parting words or words of wisdom or final thoughts or however you want to term it would you leave the listeners with today? <laughs> I hate this question. Um, let's see. Okay, why? There's why? I'm so curious. To choose from. Uh, follow your breath. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, let me but what you choose tells us so much, yeah, and, right. and that's why I like it. That's why, as cliche as it is. <laughs> okay, let's see. Hold on. Every day, it's a different thing. Um, every day, in every way. If you open your eyes and it's there, it's masculine. If you close your eyes and it's there, it's feminine. I suspect now that you've listened to the episode, you know why I didn't do my typical summary at the beginning. And I'd rather not do a poor job if I can get away with doing no job and letting the guest do it so much better. And that's what we had today. I really enjoyed this episode. Such a great conversation. And I really hope I get to talk to him again. So, Sifu. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it, your time. If you want to learn more about this episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 454. You'll see a bunch of resources over there, from photos and links to a bunch more to help you get more out of this show. Maybe you want to contact Sifu. It's all there for you, all for free. If you got something out of this episode, share it with your friends. Help people learn about martial arts radio and everything we've got going on here. Or you can leave us a review iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, Google, tons of places. You leave us a review, it helps. Or you can make a purchase. Whistlekick.com, Podcast 15 gets you 15% off any of the stuff over there. We're always looking for great guest suggestions, so don't be afraid to reach out on that. There's a form on the website. Our social media is at Whistlekick, and my email address is jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.